I'm Mas Chaponder. I'm going to be covering infectious diseases. The first section that we will consider is the returning traveler. I'm sure you will notice there's a particular theme that follows in the exams, um, which is clinically relevant. And so all the questions you will see have a particular theme to it, which we'll come to. So here's the first question. 35-year-old woman returns from journey to the Gambia. She comes back with fever, rigors, vomiting, and diarrhea. She took chloroquine and proguanol prophylaxis. Her oxygen saturations are 90% on air, pulse of 120, blood pressure of 80 over 60, so very sick patient. What is the most likely diagnosis? And I'll give you some time to consider this question. This patient has malaria. In terms of the returning traveler, you must always think number one, malaria, number two, malaria, number three, malaria, then everything else in the exams and in real life. Um, there are things here, I'll discuss all the others first and they'll tell you why it's malaria. So this could do for pneumococcal pneumonia, you know, a pulse of uh, a low oxygen saturation and uh, low blood pressure. So pretty sick pneumonia, but you wouldn't expect diarrhea uh, and rigors and uh, temperature uh, from the Gambia with someone with pneumococcal pneumonia or even an atypical pneumonia. The diarrhea might do for an atypical pneumonia, but here really the number one diagnosis for a returning traveler from West Africa has to be malaria. The reminder there is that malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes and it's mainly the female Anopheles mosquito. The question is why does she have low oxygen saturations, 90%? She has a complication of malaria which is um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, also known as pulmonary leak syndrome, which is a known complication of malaria. They can also, on top of it all, get gram-negative sepsis. So on top of covering malaria treatment, I would cover this patient with gram-negative antibacterial treatment. Of note, even though she has taken chloroquine and proguanil, she can still have malaria because in areas like West Africa, East Africa, there's a lot of resistance to chloroquine. So don't let that mislead you to thinking it can't be malaria because she's on prophylaxis. Looking at fever and the returning travelers, use the timing in the question. So if the patient has come back within a week and they have a rash, it's more likely to be dengue. If they've been on safari, they've got a rash, it's something weird they've picked up in the game park like tick typhus if there have been any water involved, so somebody who's been in water and they're jaundiced, uh, you'd be thinking of places like leptospirosis, even if they've been to Amsterdam. They've been to Amsterdam, the canals, water, etc., and they're pre presenting with jaundice, you'd think more of leptospirosis before you start thinking of hepatitis and drug abuse in Amsterdam. Three weeks later, you'd be thinking of falciparum malaria, and that can present in any way, and that's why it's favored in the exams, because of the various ways that it can present. West Africa, the other thing to think about are the viral hemorrhagic fevers like Lassa fever, but usually they'll be talking about edema, death around the patient in the village, etc. Later on, when you're talking about one month presenting after coming back from a tropical area, for example, you'd be thinking of amoebiasis, especially if there's bloody diarrhea, typhoid, especially if they're talking about splenomegaly and normal white cells, falciparum malaria, again, common theme here. Six weeks later on, you'd be thinking of hepatitis A, which is fecal oral. We'll come to questions about that. Uh, schistosomiasis mustn't be forgotten if they've been swimming in any freshwater lakes. And usually in the exams, they talk about this patient has been in a freshwater lake in Victoria, for example. And that's usually leading you down the line of schistosomiasis. If the patient is presenting much later on, three months, sometimes even longer than three months, we're talking six months to years, malaria still comes in there, especially the benign malarias, Vivax, Ovale, and malaria. HIV seroconversion, especially if they've got a rash, a bit of a sore throat, almost like Epstein-Barr virus. And then hepatitis B has a big feature in, um, well, hepatitis is a big feature in the exams, and we'll come to specific questions, but let's move on to question number two. Here we have a 40-year-old woman presenting with progressive confusion and mild neck stiffness. A CT scan shows basal meningeal enhancement, meningitis. A lumbar puncture shows a high opening pressure of 200 millimeters of water, turbid CSF with a very high white cell count. 90% of them are lymphocytes. 
glucose concentration of one, so a, a low glucose, and negative results for gram stain, India Inc., and Zeal Nelson. CSF protein is elevated. What is the best treatment? Here they assume, given all that information, you have worked out what is the organism. And so, what is the treatment of choice? That's a tricky one there. This is clearly meningitis, but I think there are a few clues here that point to direction. One, it's a lymphocytic meningitis with a low glucose, negative gram stain, negative India ink. When they say negative India ink, they're pretty much trying to tell us that this is not cryptococcal meningitis. We know that very rarely cryptococcal um, meningitis can present with a negative India ink, but that's really rare clinically and in the clinical and in the exam setting, an India ink, which is negative, excludes cryptococcal meningitis. The lymphocytosis tells us this is not bacteria, so B is wrong. A cyclovir, you wouldn't expect the low glucose. Corticosteroids, really, in this case, you're not thinking of something like SLE, for example. There's clear evidence of a meningitic process from an organism. Uh, and liposomal amphotericin B is what you'd be considering when you're treating someone from cryptococcal meningitis. So the answer here is tuberculous meningitis. And that would be treated with the standard treatment, rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, and you would use steroids. You would use steroids on top of TB treatment because there's paradoxical enlargement of, uh, of uh, and edema and, and lymph nodes before treatment is fully effective. This is a slide showing that meningeal enhancement, showing essentially meningitis. But I think for the exams, this slide is very important. When you're faced with questions, if you can commit this to the mind and decide, it, it guides you in terms of what type of meningitis it is. So bacterial meningitis, you will note high white cell count, which are mainly polymorphs. There'll be high protein and very low glucose. The case we showed did not have uh, polymorphs, they were lymphocytes. So when you have high lymphocytes, the differential then are the next, uh, are the following. So viral meningitis, there'll be a few lymphocytes, but the protein and glucose will not really be affected. Tuberculous meningitis, as in that case, can be a mixed picture of polymorphs and lymphocytes. The longer their history, the more likely you are to get lymphocytosis. But remember, you can have polymorphs in that setting. There will be very high protein and low glucose as the mycobacteria use up and utilize the glucose. The difficulty becomes in differentiating fungal from TB meningitis. They both have lymphocytosis, although the protein is higher with tuberculous meningitis, they both lower fungal, uh, they both lower the glucose. And so what you will notice is that with fungal meningitis, we will add the cryptococcal antigen in that test, in, in the question as a clue. Brain abscess, it's not really in the CSF, it's paraventricular, and so you won't have much in terms of white cell counts, you may have a spillover of protein and glucose, but this is paraventricular rather than in the ventricles causing a meningitis. And then of course, Guillain-Barre, not to be forgotten, the infection has been and gone, whether it's Campylobacter or whatever organism, what you have left here is the immune response, high protein with very few uh, white cells and no change in your glucose. Another returning traveler also went to the Gambia. 41-year-old bird watcher went on a beach holiday in the Gambia. She took no malaria prophylaxis. On return to the UK, she develops high fever. She self-medicates at home with Lemsip. On presentation at the hospital, she has a fever of 40 and looks very unwell. She has a pulse of 130, low blood pressure. She's commenced on keftriaxone and quinine, as one would rightly do, antibiotic and anti-malaria. Despite this, she deteriorates rapidly and after two hours is found to have a GCS of three. Her blood film is reported as showing trophozoites, schizonts of plasmodium falciparum with a paracetamia of 20%. So they're telling us she has malaria. The question is, which of the following is most important as the next step in the management of this patient? 
Once her airway, breathing and circulation have been stabilized, please consider these options. Here, what I've demonstrated is a blood film, a peripheral blood film uh, of malaria, essentially. And what you see, and what is characteristic for falciparum, inside the red cells, you can see this sort of headphone pattern. And that's falciparum malaria, should you be shown a slide like that. But the answer, coming back to the answer, this patient either has hypoglycemia due to malaria, or due to the quinine itself, which can cause hypoglycemia, or cerebral malaria, which is a complication of malaria. What she needs urgently in a comatose uh, state with a GCS of three immediately on quinine is a blood glucose testing for hypoglycemia. An urgent CT really won't show you anything in malaria. Use and ease, you would naturally do them, but the one that you want to act on immediately is the glucose because that can save the life and immediately you would see a response in that patient. Phenytoin infusion can be given to prevent seizures or when they have seizures with cerebral malaria. And chloroquine I would not use. Quinine and doxycycline are the mainstay of treatment in a patient who is this unwell. There is no role for chloroquine. Chloroquine we would use for the benign malarias, so malaria, ovale and vivax, you would use chloroquine. Once again, the blood film showing that typical headphone appearance, which is suggestive, the ring form of falciparum malaria. That is the deadly type of malaria, and that is the one that you treat with quinine and doxycycline. Another question. A 19-year-old man, born and brought up in Nepal, and now studying accountancy, attends the outpatients with a swelling in his neck. He has a history of fever, night sweats, and weight loss. An AFB, and that's alcohol acid fast bacilli stain from a fine needle aspira uh, aspiration, proved positive, and he was commenced on quadruple antituberculous therapy. Now, two weeks later, his LFTs have become deranged with an ALT of 400 and bilirubin of 50. What is the most important management step? Please consider these options here. The correct answer is to stop all TB medication. When the ALT goes to five times the upper limit of normal, which would be 400, the guidelines are you must stop all the TB medication because we know rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazidamine, and ethambutol, all of them will cause a hepatitis. HIV will not usually present with hepatitis. Blood cultures, there's nothing here to indicate bacterial sepsis on somebody who is compliant to quadruple therapy for their TB. And liver ultrasound scan will really not be useful in this case. It will, show, it will either be normal or may show a bit of inflammation. And prednisolone has no role in uh, drug-induced hepatitis, as in this case. This is a, 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 a photo showing a patient who is jaundiced to remind you that all of the TB drugs, all four drugs, will cause jaundice. And just to look at the TB drugs more closely as they appear in the exams, it mainly focuses in the exams on the side effects of the treatment. So rifampicin will cause hepatitis, but in addition, it can cause GI disturbance, flu-like illnesses, and then also it colors all the body fluids orange. So the urine may be orange, the tears are orange and we ask them not to wear contact lenses because they can be stained orange from rifampicin. Isoniazid will cause peripheral neuropathy, especially in those who are slow acetylators. It can also cause psychosis. I've seen one question in the data bank, um, uh, in the MRC data bank, on someone presenting with acute psychosis on isoniazid. Hepatotoxicity, optic neuritis. Ethambutol is the one drug that we always talk about in terms of optic neuritis, and they usually start with red-green color blindness, second week, third week after starting TB treatment. And usually, before you start TB treatment, you would do an Ishihara test on them. Pyrazinamide is classic in, in terms of causing gout and arthralgia, but all of them, as I said, will cause uh, drug-induced hepatocellular jaundice.
Let's consider the next question. This is, again, returning travelers. Remember the theme. A 72-year-old woman returns to the UK after a visit to her son who is working out in Kenya. She is admitted into A&E from the plane with fever and confusion, and she's become incontinent of urine during the flight. She's usually very well. Her medication of note is endapamide. You will remember that that is an antihypertensive which she takes. On examination, she has a high temperature, she's hypotensive, and she has a pulse of 95. She looks jaundiced. You call her son, and he tells you that she's been relatively well, apart for, from a minor cough over the past few days. He reports that during the trip, they went on safari within the past week, and she bathed in some local pools. So lots of clues and differentials there that you can build up on. The local pools, the safari, the minor cough. She's presenting very sick with jaundice. Let's consider the investigations. HB of 9.9, .9, white cell is elevated, so anemic, high white cells, low platelets. Sodium 134, slightly low, potassium 5.9, and look, her renal function has gone off. Her creatinine is 201. Her LFTs have also gone off. Her bilirubin is elevated, her ALT is elevated, and her glucose is on the low side. So, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Lots of clues, lots to confuse. Consider these following diagnoses. She also has malaria, and I'm banging on about malaria because it is important and it's our top differential, but let's talk about why it's not the others and then why it is malaria. So dengue fever usually will present within the first week and they will usually present with a purpuric rash. In the exams, it's within a month, usually within a week, presenting with a, with a rash. Your renal function will be normal and there is rarely any involvement of the kidneys. That's why it's not dengue. Urinary tract infection, you can't really explain jaundice in someone presenting with a urinary tract infection, so unlikely. Again, listeria meningitis will present with a, a meningitic picture, but unlikely to present with jaundice and hepat uh, hepatic and renal impairment. Vials disease, so leptospirosis, will, can give you renal impairment, but again, this is unlikely to give you, if we go back one slide, to this picture, and I think this is where we should focus. The low hemoglobin, the low platelets, those two things really point towards malaria. Do not be misled by jaundice, which results from hemolysis in malaria. So as there's schizogony, breakup of the red cells, you get jaundice being produced in malaria as well. And, so, and you can also have a low sodium. I know the white cell count there may have misled some of you, but you can get gram-negative sepsis very often coexistent with malaria, complicating malaria. And so this is a very important question because it shows the very varied presentations and the many mixtures in, in terms of how malaria can present. Moving on, I think I'll just touch on malaria prophylaxis because that's something that one is often asked about and one can be confused about. In terms of malaria prophylaxis, not all these drugs are used in the treatment, but they can be used for prophylaxis of malaria. At the moment, mefloquine is the commonest drug, also known as larium. Remember, it will present clinically and also in the exams with patients having side effects. A few patients can become, frankly, psychotic. Most of us either have pleasant dreams, and they can be really good dreams, or really, really bad nightmares. And with that happens, you stop the mefloquine immediately. For that reason, we ask that patients should start the mefloquine when they're in the country of origin, so in the UK, for example, before they go out to the forest, so that if they have side effects, you can stop this drug early. Doxycycline can be used in treatment and in prophylaxis. Remember, the side effect is photosensitivity rash. Atovacone proguano, also known as malarone, has to be taken every day. It's quite expensive, but very effective. Chloroquine proguano, less and less being used now because of high resistance across the equatorial sub-Sahara and uh, Southeast Asia region, high resistance to chloroquine. So that one is less likely to be used and certainly not used in the treatment except for the benign malarias as I explained. 
Let's move away from malaria now, still with the theme of the returning traveler. So you see this man who has recently returned from a trip to Zambia. He complains of fever, joint pains, and diarrhea, and has a rash all over his body. Which one of the following is most likely? And I give you those to consider. Again here, let's consider each one. Um, HIV. Acute HIV, which means HIV seroconversion, that will usually present with a rash, and other than that, the patient is usually asymptomatic. They would rarely would they present with joint pains, and I've never seen a case of diarrhea. Gonococcal infection will not present with diarrhea. They will usually present with urethral discharge. Inflammatory bowel disease will not really present with a rash. And Reiter's syndrome uh, would usually have urethritis, conjunctivitis, and arthritis. So that leaves us with Salmonella typhi, which is typhoid. And I think we shall talk a little bit more about typhoid um, and the various ways that it can present. So it can present with the red blanching macular rash, and that's known as rose spots. So sometimes they may be called rose spots in the exams. But there are other forms of presentation that can present with headache, uh, epistaxis, relative bradycardia, so very high temperature with a relative bradycardia to what you would expect. They may have all sorts of complications, but in terms of diagnosis, it's mainly blood cultures and urine and stools. We would really not use the Vidal test anymore. That's an obsolete test. Let us now consider question number seven. This is a 32-year-old man who returns from a cruise from the River Nile in Egypt. During the trip, he made a point of trying some local food from the various stops along the river for a few days before coming home. And since his return, he has suffered from diarrhea, which floats on the surface of the toilet bowl and is hard to flush away. He has also noticed that his abdomen feels very bloated and the diarrhea occasionally contains blood. His partner complains that he has increased flatulence and, this, and that smells disgusting. A fresh stool sample is obtained, which appears to contain some cysts. Which of the following represent the most likely infective cause? If we go to the answer, there's only really one cause. It looks, it smells like giardia. Giardia makes you very bloated, full of gas, and the stool that comes out is very pale and can't be flushed easily. And that's, and the cysts, so they've given us a lot of clues there to tell us that this is giardia. Shigella and Campylobacter usually give us the, 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 the bloody diarrhea, although with giardia you can sometimes have that. Salmonella typhi, we've talked about that, and Staph aureus would rarely give bloody diarrhea, although that is continuous diarrhea, food poisoning usually, within six hours of ingestion of contaminated food. So the correct answer in this case is giardia. Very distinctive smell. Let's consider question number eight. This is a 35-year-old man who presents with a two-day history of fever, malaise, wheeze, mild diarrhea, an urticarial rash, and hepatosplenomegaly. He has recently returned from a three-month overland trip in East Africa. He can recall numerous insect bites on his trip. His adherence to his anti-malaria prophylaxis has been poor. He has swum in freshwater rivers and lakes. He has consumed local food and beverages. His full blood count on admission shows a normal hemoglobin and platelets count but a raised white cell count of 15.7. Neutrophils, 26%, lymphocytes, 21%, eosinophils, 45%, with a monocyte of 1%. No malaria parasites are detected on the film. And the question here is, what is the most likely diagnosis? The answer here is schistosomiasis. They tried to lead us down the path of malaria, because I've been saying malaria, 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 
but they tell us the malaria film is negative, and indeed, not always is that correct. So one film being negative is not enough. You require three negative films. However, there is more to it here. If you notice right at the end of the question, this patient had eosinophilia. They also had been swimming in freshwater lake, either Lake Victoria, Lake Malawi, for example, and the urticarial rash, the swimmer's itch, all point to schistosomiasis. And remember that with schistosomiasis, there's hematobium uh, or mansoni. And if you look in the urine or stool, depending on which type, you will see the ova there. And so this is a patient presenting with acute schistosomiasis, which can be complicated with bloody diarrhea. That covers the section on returning travelers and the questions in the exams for that. Remembering that malaria is the commonest question asked and its various complications, and then the other areas covered. In lecture two, we will now look at HIV and its complications and the related questions. Thank you.